All right, welcome everybody to the May 2023 imaging uh, meeting. Uh, tonight's topic is about the seldom imaged uh, star clusters. And uh, if anybody's been to all of our meetings, we talk about all the objects in the night sky, we talk about all the processing techniques, but one thing we do not talk about in regards to the night sky is uh, imaging uh, globular clusters, open clusters and whatnot. I mean, think about it just our huge wide field view of the Milky Way, well, there you go. There is an open cluster right there. So that's the topic for tonight. And uh, what I wanted to do, get uh, all of our members here together and show us what they have as far as uh, old uh, images they have of star clusters, uh, their best image they have of all the star clusters they've taken. And uh, finally, maybe if you're willing to divulge or uh, you know, we can talk it over like uh, what would be a cool thing to do for the imaging target challenge in July, which is a globular cluster. Well, we can have a discussion about that as well. So uh, anyway, um, well, we'll go ahead and get started uh, with that in mind. Uh, so we'll see what you got as far as old images of uh, star clusters. It doesn't matter what, open, uh, closed, which I guess is a fancy way of saying globular. <laughs> And, uh, uh, well, like I said, the Milky Way itself is a large star cluster. And, uh, you know, and then show us what your favorite uh, image of that you've taken of a star cluster. And then, once again, if you want to talk about uh, what you plan on imaging for the Target Challenge in July, uh, we're all here. So who would like to go first? Hmm. I can go, Chris, if you want. Oh, I always want somebody to go first. All right. Is that working? Yep, I see it. Globular. All right, good. All right. Uh, so I went back to to what ten years ago almost uh, to find uh, something relatively decent. Some of the stuff I had was terrible, and I got to really show it. So this was uh, M5 in 2014 uh, with my Canon 60D uh, camera on a, my Stellar View 102 triplet. It's about the time I got it. So this is one of the first things I tried to do with that. And you see it's noisy, and it's, it's uh, kind of, I don't know, it's not great. I didn't really know what I was doing yet at that point at all. And I certainly didn't know how to process and there was no fix inside at the time or any of that. So I, uh, uh, best I could do with Photoshop at that time uh, and, and probably Deep Sky Stacker or something, I don't even know. Was that, uh, oh, so you said Stacker. Oh, okay, I did Deep Sky Stacker, I mean, so it's not a humble image. Deep Sky Stacker or something like that because I didn't have fix inside back then. To, to do this. Now, I don't remember the details on this one. Um, then, uh, let's see, hang on, I got the next one. Okay, this is a, a little, a same M5 again, in 2017 with my Celestron Edge 8 uh, and a variety of other things. So I had a lot more equipment at, that, at this point. Um, and I had fixed in sight and Photoshop and all that. So this is a, uh, 36 five minute exposures of that. And again, it's not great. Uh, I still didn't really know what I was doing at all back then, but at least I got a lot of stars. And it's, it's better. Eve, I, didn't, I didn't know you had an Edge 8. Oh, yeah. Had it for okay. a long time. Uh, but I don't use it very much because mostly I'm doing middle band, but I, I do need to start using it more. And I have a Hyperstar for it too, which I haven't used much either. So I'm gonna, you know, I could get into that again. Um, so this is like six years ago, something like that. And then this is uh, again six years ago. I was trying to do uh, this is with a Stellar View 70 millimeter that I had, and my ATEC 460 EX camera, uh, which is just just luminosity at that point. And the stars are pretty wonky and, and haloed and that kind of thing. Uh, so my first my first attempt at a, at a lot of exposures with the 80s. So 
again, I would do it very differently now. Hey, Steve, uh, a little off subject. Uh, uh, that Lodestar guy camera, do you still use that? No. No, okay. It died. It died. Oh. Yeah, I'm using my 170, my 174 now for for the guide scope on that. So, for the guide camera. All right, and then uh, the double cluster in Perseus, well, with the in 2017 with the comet in the same area there, and that was kind of cool to have that all that in one place. So that's about 140 minutes of exposure. So it's something I tried. That was this with this again with the stellar view 70 millimeter triplet and the uh, VWO uh, 71 color color camera for this one. And then this is M15. I was shot in 2015 with the Stellar View 102 and the Canon 60D, but I reprocessed it last year. I just went through and, and re, re stacked it and, and fiddled with it some more, partly because I wanted to, to uh, look for the uh, propeller in this. Uh, and so here's this is the thing to look for when you're doing M15 is this propeller structure here at the top. Uh, at least in this picture, it's at the top. And then you see these other other galaxies floating around in here that you can get it if you look at M15. I think there are even more uh, in this picture somewhere, but I don't have the labels for them. But for this, I might try to do something like this again, because some of these uh, clusters have other structures near them or, or in them, which is kind of fun in this propeller thing here, this two, three prong thing here is, is interesting to try to image if you can. Uh, so that's so, you know, and then lots of times there's interesting things around them to get it, to try to capture as well. Uh, this was 45 90 second exposures uh, at that time. So, and I've got much better cameras and much better things now that I can use for this kind of thing. So, so I'll, I'll pick a cluster and probably sit on it for a long time, especially if it has some kind of interesting structures around it. But I haven't decided on that yet. So, I don't know where this is in the sky right now, so this might be something to look at if it's available. I don't know. Uh, that's what I've got, Chris, for clusters anyway. Okay, very good. Sure. Hey, Steve. Yeah. I have a question about your your M15 here. Um, you know, I'm I'm aware of the propeller that's in M13, but I didn't know that M15 had one also. Maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe I'm. Maybe it is M13. I may have labeled it wrong. So I'll, I'll look again. I'm sorry if I labeled it wrong. It's possible. Well, you got a nice galaxy there in the picture too. So yeah, M15, M15 is in what Pegasus, I think. So it's a fall object. Oh, okay. but it's probably M13 then. I'll just have to look. I'll look at my labels again. I probably got it wrong. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not sure. So uh, uh, with, with a grain yeah, of salt. It could very well be right. I must just label label the uh, file wrong. But yeah, but that, that's that's fun to look for. Yeah, you can see it visually as as well as um, you know in, in photos. Yeah. Okay, I'm done sharing. I think. Okay, I'll go next. Okay, so um, everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, very good. I can see it on my phone here. Okay. Um, anyways, uh, so as you can probably see on the tile there, that's uh, M3, which is in uh, constellation. I don't know. I just like the last name of this constellation. It's two words, Serpent's Kaput. Is that how you say it, Mark? You're, you're, you know all this terminology or this uh, fancy It's name. Latin, so it sounds good to me. Kaput. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, uh, so this was taken with a uh, a uh, Schmidt Newtonian. It was called the SN8 by uh, by Mead. It was a pretty nice design, actually, and uh, it was meant to uh, it 
basically it's a, a new Tonian with a uh, Schmidt corrector plate over it. People have uh, seen some older pictures of this before and I've you know, described the same optical uh, uh, arrangement of a, uh, of a Schmidt Newtonian. Now, yeah, it's not centered. And the reason why that is, is because, well, I just got my DSLR, had no guiding, was just purely trying to, the go-tos on the uh, crappy uh, uh, equatorial mount I had at the time weren't that great. So I had to like search them out um, uh, visually first, which was kind of tough through the window of a, a DSLR. <laughs> So, but the DSLR that I used, this was a Canon 350D, and uh, this is actually the only, uh, or excuse me, this is actually only one exposure to it. But uh, as far as like it being uh, a uh, Newtonian, uh, well, the, uh, just zoom in here, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the coma is not that bad. I mean, here you get into the co corners here and it starts to become obvious for, uh, for obvious reasons, but, uh, uh, that was the uh, uh, the thing uh, uh, the design was uh, known for. It was meant to uh, uh, keep a uh, coma down uh, that's uh, inherent in all uh, Newtonian type uh, telescopes. And this was an F four, which is a very popular an eight inch F four, and which is a very popular uh, you know focal ratio for uh, new, uh, imaging Newtonians. And I have seen images at eight hundred millimeters. <laughs> you know, four times 200 millimeter aperture uh, at 800 millimeters where the coma was a lot worse. So that Schmidt, uh, Schmidt plate, uh, corrector plate they put on the front of that, yeah, it, yeah, it helped it uh, quite a bit. So, but I ended up selling that. I don't have it anymore. Um, still had the 350D that I took with it. But anyway, that's M3 and Serpent's Kaput. Yeah, that's the best part of it. Serpent's Kaput. <laughs> so, hey, you know, Chris? Chris? Do what? You, you said you had a 350D. Is that an XTI? No, even lower than that, man. Is it XT? It's an 8 megapixel XT. That's right. Oh, man. <laughs> I used to have one of those. <laughs> it died. Yeah, that was, yeah, it's still working, actually. Uh, I, I used it while I was in Arizona just to try it out and see how dark uh, Tucson sky was, you know, right in the middle of Tucson. And it's pretty dark. Uh, there, I mean, you can't even. You have to watch where you're going. Uh, you're like going, walking up to your house because of the strict uh, light lighting ordinances they have there. You can have scot. Uh, you're all, as far as outdoor lighting, you can only have sconces on your house, and the sconces have to point down. And so it's pretty strict, and you, you're only allowed just a few sconces on your house. Uh, anyway, but that's a subject for another time. But uh, anyway. So here's M11. I want to say this is called also called the Wild Duck Cluster. Uh, you know, the veterans out there, did, did I get that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, um, it's I want to say it's either in Sagittarius or Scorpius. Uh, I cannot remember which one. I believe it's Scutum. Scutum. Okay, so neither of those. Very good. Got it wrong. Okay, so Scutum. Uh, anyway. It's pretty close to the, the Milky Way, uh, the thickest part of the Milky Way that you can see here at uh, our latitude in North Carolina. Uh, but obviously it's, a, it's an open cluster and uh, you see how thick the star field is. Yeah, and this is also uh, using that Schmidt Newtonian 800 millimeters. So it just, just gives you an idea of, uh, uh, of, uh, of your sense of uh, where these objects are in Milky Way galaxies. So like if I go back here at M3, you hardly see, uh, you don't see anywhere near as many background stars as you do with this guy right here. So anyways, uh, okay. So next one, that was also with the 350D as well. So uh, Schmidt Newtonian, 800 millimeters, 350D uh, DSLR. And uh, then of course here's the yeah Steve I do believe this what uh, what you're showing us was M13 so uh, here's uh, M13 this was one of the last images I took with the uh, Schmidt Newtonian before I um, got rid of it and uh, there's that galaxy down there that Steve was pointing out and then let's see I think this is the one that he was also pointing out yeah right there that guy right there I don't know. 
I guess that's a pro yeah, Steve. I, I had never heard of the propeller until you mentioned it, so I don't know. You can see it in your picture. Yeah, it is M13. I'm, I mislabeled. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the propeller too. Is it right here? Well, you, you, you had the hand on it just a second ago. Go down into your left just a bit. Go oh, down into the left. To the left. Down a little bit more. Down a little bit. Oh, that That's thing. It. Okay, I see it. Yeah, 120 degree little thing. Yeah. All right, very good. Okay, yeah. Anyway, that was spent Newtonian. That was one of the last images uh, I took with it, but still with the 350D. Canon. Uh, all right, next. Uh, this uh, I, that was pro that was my uh, first uh, stacked image with a um, on a uh, star cluster using uh, my first star cluster stacked image. There you go. Here, that's the way you should say it. Yeah. So it turned out okay. And uh, this one, I tried to do an HDR with it, like you know, short uh, uh, short exposures, because if you do a bright exposure to get all these uh, nice little stars out. Um, out on the perimeter of it. Um, what is it? Uh, uh, well, you'll get them to show up, but uh, you may not get the, um, uh, you may uh, end up uh, blowing out the core. So it's uh, similar to the way that you would image the uh, 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 M42, the Brian Nebula, where you want to pick up all that faint dust around the core of it, but you don't want to blow out the core. So you do short exposures of the core and put them together. <laughs> in whatever imaging program you wish. So anyway, so there we go. Uh, let's see, who's next? Uh, okay, so M38, this is a single exposure. Um, I believe that is a, another open cluster right there. This is located in, I think, Auriga is where this guy is. And, uh, but uh, yeah, if you do like a wide field view image of like, uh, the uh, uh, the flame nebula and the tab hold, the tab holds and everything. If you do a really wide field image, you can pick this up off to the side a little bit. But anyway, again, Schmidt Newtonian, uh, eight hundred millimeters and the uh, three fifty D camera. M forty four. That is my stunning uh, beehive nebula. M forty four, as uh, Devine had mentioned. Uh, <laughs> we'll see what you got. Take this for your target challenge and show those uh, visual <laughs> visual observers what they're missing. Okay, but anyway, uh, uh, 800 millimeters, yeah, I think it's pushing it for this thing because this is 800 millimeters. Once again, this is with the 8 megapixel camera, the three uh, Canon 350D, and um, uh, a single exposure still. And um, if you're... Uh, if I had known what I was doing back then, as far as imaging goes, I would have taken one. Yes, of course, I would have taken more than one uh, exposure and stacked them. But also probably would have processed it a little more gently because the stars, uh, the spectrum of uh, stars that you have here, uh, it's pretty wide. You have nice orange ones. You have uh, bright blue ones. And of course, you got your yellows and your whites in here. It's a really cool cluster if you can get a... Uh, uh, get a good image of it but uh, uh just judging by this i probably wouldn't do um maybe 600 millimeters or less as far as imaging it so you can get a good sense of it because you can tell this is a cluster and it's kind of congested in the center here making it a cluster but uh it, it just really doesn't stand out that well if it's uh taking one uh such a long focal length but anyway here we go Okay, so here's a scene, there's single exposure. This uh, again is, uh, well, this also demonstrates exactly uh, how much of a beginner I was because you can see how there's light fall off from the center. And uh, that gets fixed uh, if you were to take a flap. And uh, I distinctly remember this, Mark, and I'm glad you're here tonight. I showed you this picture years ago. Yes, years ago. And um, I asked you, uh, well, what is this, Amy, and how do you fix it? And you said, and you said flats. I was like, oh, I heard of those. Uh, that's what they're used for. <laughs> so anyways, yeah. So, uh, but the thing that's nice about M46, I forgot to uh, mention what that is. Uh, uh, Mark, you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong. I believe this is in the constellation of, of Cupis or Puppus, yeah. something like that. I, I say Puppus. Okay, 
Anyway, uh, and there's another star cluster that's not too far away from it um, called, uh, well, M46, and so it was right next to it. This game must have immediately saw it, called it M47, called that one M47. But, yeah, if you take a wide field image of this, you'll also pick that one up uh, in there. So it's, it's a nice open cluster, and, of course, the uh, cherry on top of it. It has a, a, a planetary nebula in there. That's a nice uh, little blue there. Um, or not blue, excuse me, uh, green there. Of course, uh, I didn't have this white balanced or anything. Uh, just put it on there, took a lot of exposure, and this is what I got. But, yeah, that's a really cool uh, open cluster right there. And that's something I want to go back and do, maybe, uh, is, like I was saying, do a wide field image of uh, the two together, M46 and M47 together. Um, the downside of it is that it's in puppet, uh, the uh, constellation Puppets, which is uh, deep into going into the heart of uh, the Milky Way core, and it's very low on the horizon here in North Carolina for our latitude. So uh, you probably wouldn't want to go take this where you have a, a, a dark southern sky, um, southern horizon rather, and uh, uh, image it from there. But uh, anyway, so there's that. Then we got this guy, another globular cluster in 92, and uh, the Hercules cluster, which is uh, that guy right there in 13, uh, called the Hercules cluster, because it's in constellation Hercules. Well, uh, this guy right here is also in the uh, constellation Hercules. I believe uh, it's the next brightest uh, star cluster in, in the constellation. And as you can see, this was also taken at 800 millimeters with, again, 350D, and it's a single exposure. Uh, you can see uh, how much smaller uh, this globular cluster is versus M13. Uh, uh, I would say, if I can get my bearings right, I believe this is north of M13 in the night sky on the celestial sphere. So um, it's not within the uh, keystone, which is where uh, the keystone uh, asterism of uh, the Hercules constellation, where N13 resides. No, it's north of that. So uh, N92, cute little, cute little globular. And finally, uh, so we were supposed to, uh, we're not we are. I mean, so it was up to you, but uh, uh, showing uh, my best. Uh, Star cluster image. Well, <laughs> lazy star cluster. Hey, there's so much to, to see there. It's such a uh, such a bright open cluster in the night sky. I believe it's the brightest open cluster in the night sky, and um, and well, it has all this nice uh, dust and nebulosity uh, reflection nebulae um, coursing through it. So, however, uh, I look at this and going along with uh, Steve's uh, image that he took of uh, the double cluster. Uh, well, I have this image of Pleiades, which I think is a really cool um, open cluster or just star cluster in general image, but I have this guy too right here. And uh, this is uh, 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 Common Garrett. And if I remember correctly, this was taken back in 2011, I think. I, uh, I may have done this with the 350D. I may have still had the 350D, and that's what I did this with. And this was not taken with a uh, a uh, uh, Schmidt uh, uh, Newtonian. This was taken with my new uh, <laughs> Stellar View uh, uh, 90 millimeter uh, 630 630 millimeter focal length 90 millimeter aperture Stellar View refractor. And uh, what's nice about this image as well? This was its first light. So uh, there you go. Um, nice, uh, nice debut for uh, that refractor. Anyway, that was common Garrett. Garrett also went uh, by um, a globular cluster, another globular cluster called uh, M seventy one. But you know, uh, for uh, 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 for the purposes of this uh, the subject matter here, what's nice is that you got two star clusters here, just like uh, Steve had double cluster. Uh, but you had this guy right here. I don't know if you call this a uh, asterism or what, but uh, I've heard it called the coat hanging cluster. So you can see, you know, this is where you would hang your coat, and here's the hanger where you would hang it on your whatever hanger, dowel rod on your door or whatever. And uh, but it also has a nice little uh, um, 
open cluster way in the background. Now, you look at the uh, overall star field here, you can see that it's pretty darn thick. So yes, this is deep within the, uh, what I like to call the Milky Way River. And this is sort of uh, in the middle of the Summer Triangle. The summer Triangle is composed of, uh, of uh, the star of Vega in the, con uh, in the constellation Mira, the uh, star of the Neb in the constellation uh, Cygnus. And then uh, finally, um, the star uh, Altair in the constellation Aquila. I think I got that right, Aquila. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so those are the three stars, uh, um, Aquila, Vega, and uh, Neb. And this area of the night sky is sort of in the middle of that. So anyways, that's all I have. Uh, however, um, I didn't put it here. There was another comment that it's funny, uh, as Steve took, and I just remembered it just now. I guess I should have put it in here. Steve Christensen, he took uh, the image of, uh, uh, what was the comment that she had that image of the double cluster, Steve? Can't hear you, Steve. Let's see, let me go back to, I have to go back to my images here. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, while he finds that. Uh, it's uh, comment C2017 T2 pan stars. Yes, that one. Uh, <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, but uh, there was another comment that went through there, and I just remembered this just now. Uh, that went through the close to the double clusters, and Mark, you probably remember this. It was called Car comment Hartley. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it was uh, October uh, two thousand eight or two thousand nine. It's the one that came through. Uh, okay. Well, no, actually, two thousand ten. It's probably two thousand ten. Oh, yeah, I, I got it. Hartley, um, I photographed it on October of 2010, right next to the uh, double cluster. Yeah, so, okay, so that makes sense. And that one I did take with the uh, uh, Schmidt Newtonian. I'm not going to throw it up here. I don't know, maybe Mark, you can dig yours up. But anyway, okay, well, that's all my stuff. Uh, who would like to go next? I can. Let's see it. Okay, so um, I put together slides. So, so my first attempt at any cluster was um, this beehive, um, February 2021. I was using my barn door tracker, my wife's SL2, and the 300 millimeter kit zoom lens that she had. Um, total of 38 one second exposures. So with the barn door tracker, didn't really see too much trailing. I didn't know what I was doing, of course. DSS and I guess I had affinity photo, that's what my notes say. Um, I wish I had the raw data for this and the next one because it'd be fun to go play with it. But um, So Naveen, I'm looking at that. Um, you have barn door tracker. I mean, was that motorized? Yeah, I, I have it. I've, I've brought it to some events. Um, it's had a small has a small stepper motor and a Raspberry Pi Pico that controls it, and it's got a five way switch, so you can do things like stop it, speed it up a little bit, you know, reverse it, which is really slow. Um, and that would be a cool topic is to have, uh, you know, uh, small equatorial mounts that are like all out equatorial mounts. You know, sometime. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, go ahead. Sorry, I love, I I love talking about it. I'll bring it to. The next in person one. Um, yeah, there you go. That's a good idea. Uh, All right, so go the, ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, no worries. The next one was um, a very rough <laughs> image. This one has the harp cluster in the middle of uh, uh, Rosette Nebula. I spent probably half an hour to an hour just trying to get it in the camera. This is with the same setup, the barn door tracker and the SL2. Um, ended up bringing out the eight inch daub to try and find the star cluster, the harp cluster in the middle. So that I knew where it was in the sky. So I can get the barn door, <laughs> the camera on that pointed at it. Um, this is when I learned that the camera doesn't respond well to hydrogen alpha, and I needed another solution for imaging. But 
I did find it eventually. Now, I, I have gone back with the barn tour and using the Canon T2i and 135 millimeter Rokinon and set it up in the backyard for fun. It was before astronomy days. Um, and, I was, and I had the, uh, the tracker with me on a table to show people at astronomy days. Um, and so this is what I was able to get with that. So it's a different camera and a different lens, so like half the focal length, but still on the barn door. I was able to pull off 15 second subs with this one. I had to toss probably half of them from vibrations. It's a, a gear driven thing and the gears are 3D printed, so they're not super precise. I, I want to get my 3D printer working again and then maybe replace it with a belt drive because uh, it, it's fun to, to play with. Um, and then of course I've learned a lot in almost two years since I did those other ones with processing and stuff. My favorite picture I've taken of cluster is double cluster. Um, it was really cool seeing some of the other pictures, of the comets near it. Um, that would be neat to have. Uh, this was with the 533MC on the, the six inch Newtonian. I believe I was out at three bears uh, for outreach. I can't really remember. Um, and I still have this as my wallpaper on my phone. You know, lock screen has one of the clusters and then the desktop has the other cluster. Uh, I haven't, haven't switched it out yet. I still love it. Very pretty. Thanks. Now, unique wise, like I don't like the green in this and I've tried reprocessing it over the last several days and I couldn't get anything that I was happy with, but uh, this is the pirate moon cluster in the dust tail of the green comet from earlier this year, C2022E3ZTF. And on the other side here, we've got Mars uh, coming through some dust. Coming through some dust? Well, I mean, <laughs> in front of it, I'm sure. But... Uh, that that was cool. Cool name, Pirate Moon. Plus the comet just happened to be going right over it. What and else do you want to do with it? I want to pull the process it so the dust here is visible. Um but that's a challenge. You can see there's a lot of noise that comes in with it. So I'll probably come back and look at it again sometime. Um, and I just really quickly, so before we started the recording, I was mentioning, I, I think it might have been that first Beehive image I posted somewhere and somebody kind of snootily commented, uh, they reserved the clusters for visual observing. I'm like, okay, fine. So that was my first one, Beehive. I came back with the roking on, so a wider field, know how to process, get some color. This is with the five inch refractor, the Esprit 120. And then my PDS, the six inch Newt. Um, I keep coming back because what clusters are pretty easy targets, stars are bright. And you got a, this one's got some interesting color in it. Um, and then to wrap it up, before I get into plans for the challenge, my latest one was with the Rokinon and the T2i, the Como Bernices cluster. Um, there's a couple of little galaxies strewn about in this as well, but it's a pretty big structure. I, I spent five hours on it, of course, hoping for some dust and then finding nothing. But <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot easier to just go try some stuff sometimes. I, I, I enjoyed that. Um, all right, so my plans. I, I went to Nina and took some pictures of the stuff I had already put in. So on the left is uh, M53 and NGC 5053. I just wanted to get two, two uh, globular clusters together. Um, these are all with the six inch newt and the 2600 mm, so an APS-C sensor. I want to go get M53 
13, which I'm, I have imaged before, but not with this scope. So I'm like, just going to go try that. And it should be a nice, easy one because it's, you know, very visible from my backyard. You're going to do a uh, HDR for that, though, aren't you? Um, I hadn't really Actually, planned I would, be, I would probably would, would be more inclined to do an HDR of the, uh, of the uh, M53 just because that other one is so dim. Mm, okay. I mean, yeah, that's something I need to plan. I'll forget. You don't have to listen to me. It's okay. No, no. I, <laughs> Chris, you have a little bit of experience. <laughs> um, all right. So then other things. So shoot the M22, pretty low into the south. I have to shoot between my house and my neighbor's house. But I really want to try for that star field around it. Looks really interesting. And then M15 with looks like some dust next to it. So I'm like, I'm okay, I'm in. And then as a stretch goal, again, this is low into the south. So this would be after other targets, but um, it's three clusters with dark nebula stretched between them. And because of the way I orient my camera, I'll have to do a weird mosaic, but I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. That's it. And this is... Yeah. Well, as I said, this one's a stretch goal. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, who would like to go next? No one? Okay. Uh... I, I can go, Chris. I, can I was about to say, I was hoping Mark would have something. <laughs> um, let's see. Let me share. I, I don't have a whole lot, but I'll, I'll do a little bit. Let me share. And Can you guys see a picture of a cluster? We do. Okay. So Chris, when you put this thing out there, I started to panic because when I start to look for my first picture of anything, it's going to be taken with a film camera. And uh, I always shot. Oh I always shot on. Uh, <laughs> I always shot on thirty-five millimeter slides. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what you said a minute ago. Oh, I was just saying, oh my God, this is great. Yeah, I always wanted to see film <laughs> images all the time. So, you know, I got like a ton of stuff that's, um, you know, that was taken and I didn't take good notes and can't identify what it is and all that kind of stuff. But this is one that I could. I took this picture in on April 1st, 1994. And uh, I actually had notes about it. Um, this is M46 in Puppis and M47 to its right, and you'll see a plane going through the middle. But this was taken with my Genesis. I, you know, I've had that Genesis telescope for 34, 35 years, and uh, this is one of the first few shots I had taken through it. And uh, back then, I had it riding piggyback on top of my C11, which was a fork-mounted Schmidt cast. And uh, this is a 22 minute single exposure. And so uh, that's why we see a plane go through. There was, you know, we didn't do stacking back then, at least I didn't. I mean, you you might have been able to stack film. Maybe Johnny did that. But um, at, at any rate, uh, focusing, you know, this thing was incredibly difficult through the viewfinder of a, a single lens reflex camera. And this was taken on ASA 400. Um, slide film, but I used to have this little thing you'd slide over the viewfinder. It was a magnifier. Then you'd try to focus up the best you could with that magnifier. So I just want to stress that today we got it so good. It's incredible. <laughs> well, I look at this picture and I'm looking at the title of it there, you know, one dash uh, M46 underscore 47 underscore ADE. So did you like st uh, stick this in a pixel side and process it a bit? I did, and the reason is, is that all my slides over the years, you know, this has been 30 years, they've, the color balance has shifted on them. 
And so they're almost all of them are all red looking. And oh, so you. one of these days I'm gonna take them all to uh and digitize them and correct the color. But uh, this is one of the few that I had uh I had digitized a number of years ago. So yeah, I use the ABE and Pix Insight to 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 take out some of the the color shift that was in it. So anyway, um, what I did next, let me slide this up here a little bit, is here's the same thing. Now this has got the little planetary nebula in it, but back in 2005 was when I got my first, you know, digital camera. I got an S big ST402. And the chip on that thing is smaller than most people's guide camera chips. But I used this thing for many years and had a lot of fun with it. It had an internal color filter wheel that I didn't use much. I, I like taking black and white, so that's that's what I did. But uh, anyway, so this is what you know what I had done you know ten years later, which was you know a definite improvement, but still focusing was hard and back. When I took this picture, this was still with my Genesis, same thing. So this is just just a tiny crop of that picture you saw a second ago. And uh, but this is the full frame of that camera. And uh, back then that camera was I got one of the original ones, and it had a software or firmware error in it where it didn't read out the the frame properly. And if you look close at the very top, you can see that the stars are shifted. Some of the stars are shifted, you know, left right of each other. But uh, so that was my first digital picture. So we had my first film picture and my first digital picture. Now these are of clusters. I had taken pictures of comets before in the moon and stuff. And then finally, um, this was taken last year. So this is the same area, same telescope, but this is with my ST402. And so I just did a little bit better composition and put together four star clusters onto, uh, wait a minute, that's five, five star clusters uh, onto uh, one frame. And, uh, you know, you can do so much more with, uh, you know, with the digital camera nowadays. And then this is the, the crop of that same area. So you can see that M46 a little better, a lot better really. <laughs> And so, you know, there's the little uh, planetary nebula in in M46. And then, can you guys see this little teeny planetary right there? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, a little bitty red planetary. I didn't even know it was there when I took the picture. But uh, so that's uh, that's kind of my evolution of uh, star clusters, at least ones that I could show you from start to finish. So, uh, Mark, can you go back to that one where you had the uh, stuff circled? Yep. So, that one that's above M46, so uh, what's that called? I have it labeled as Milot 118, but it's really Minkowski 118. Oh, okay. All right. All right. And, well, Milot, it seems like I've seen that uh, here and there uh, in, uh, you know, in astronomical images. I mean, who, who is Milot? Um, gee, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Because <laughs> that isn't the lot the name of that star cluster that's like right in the center of, or that structure or whatever in the center of the Heart Nebula. Is it? It's like a, another designation uh, by whoever Malat is. I mean, yeah, um, it usually goes by just M E L. So okay. you know, it's the shorthand for Malat. Yeah. Okay. Well, but again, right. this is mislabeled. This is Minkowski 118. I made an error when I put this together. I forgive you, Mark. Okay. <laughs> let, me, let me stop the share. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? I've got a couple, Chris. All right. Let's see, John. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> I think I uh, have photographed the Pleiades every year for the last 45 years, at least once, I think. This is a this is fairly recent. This was done. Can you see that one on screen now? 
Yeah. We're good. This was done about a year ago with a on Orion monochrome CCD camera with a filter wheel. And uh, it was the it's the equivalent of the ASI sixteen hundred mm camera and only Orion marketed it. And I was testing it. And, and this is with my uh, William Optic Star 71 uh, refractor. And it's a couple of hours of, of data through LRGB. And uh, I don't have any really early stuff. You know, I don't have my, uh, I do have a file of red images like Mark said, uh, but I, I, uh, I got a lot of black and white tech pan, hybrid tech pan images. And, uh, if you want to know, and this is uh, something I'm sure it'll do you a lot of good going forward, if you want to know why the pictures are red, the uh, blue layer of the, the photographic emulsion or the cyan or blue layer is the least stable of the of the others, and it fades quicker. So when you have less cyan and blue in the image, uh, the image gets red. That's why uh, that's why all the the pictures that you've had hanging on your wall and since the '60s, <laughs> they, they faded, but they've turned kind of pink or red. That's why because the cyan and blue faded out. I'm sure you all can use that info to to, to do wonderful that things. Makes sense. I mean, yeah. it's like when you go to adjust color on most of our processing programs. That's like you, if you subtract red, you're turning those tones cyan. That's right. Cyan is the complement of red. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I have an Epson flatbed scanner for, for slides and things like that. Yeah. The software does that kind of color correction automatically if you tell That's it. Right. To. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I've done a lot of really old photos too. And it does do a pretty good job. Yeah. Before you had to put that, put that slide in a slide copier and introduce filters there until it, it got to where you wanted it. And of course, you had to process that film. To know that's what you had. Uh, anyhow, um, you see this one, M13. Can you see that one now? No. No. Nope. Now I still see M45. Okay. Hmm, let's see. Hmm. Okay. See M13 now. Oh yes. Okay. Okay, this is uh, this is one I didn't really have a lot of uh, time on, but it's uh, uh, about a hundred sixty second exposure with my Mead fourteen inch at f six point seven, and uh, I never shot globulars that much, uh, but since I got the fourteen inch about four years ago, I've been uh, shooting a few of them, and because they're, they're starting to have the image scale that you would need to where they would you know, look cool. And uh, I did this one about uh, two weeks ago uh, in the moonlight, uh, one uh, one night before full moon. Yeah, the propeller's in the in the six o'clock position, and you're mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's a it's a it's at uh, uh, eleven o'clock. Uh, no, no, I don't think so. I Honey, take your cursor and move left and down just a minute. Okay, there now, down and over to the right now. Over to right and up a little bit. I think it's at the very bottom as far as I can see. But mm. you see, so you're right on the edge. You're on the bottom left edge of it right there. So you go up a little bit and to the right. And you can see the propeller real easy. It's a three-bladed propeller with the top one pointed at 11 o'clock. The right. left blade yeah. pointed at seven, and the right blade's at about three o'clock. Mark, yeah. I, guess, I think I said the six o'clock position, and with the with the propeller pointing down, because that's the, the top. No, oh, that's that's something else, Steve. That's not the propeller. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Wasn't the uh, propeller a a, a uh, Scotty Houston find? I, I can't remember. Didn't, didn't Scotty mention it in his Deep Sky Wonders column? Decades ago, uh, I don't remember. I just know that Jim Presley loves the, the propeller, and and we all kind of went out and, and looked, try to look for it and understand it and all that. Yeah, but yeah, you're you're right on the edge of the propeller, right there with your pointer, Johnny. Okay, okay. 
I can see it really clearly on my screen. All right. Yeah. Okay, I see it too. All right. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to pull up my picture. The globblers are cool with the with the fourteen inch. Uh, and this is uh this is one when uh, Comet Leonard passed what M uh, M three uh, what two years ago in December. That, that morning. Wow, that's this is with, this is with the uh, eight inch Rasa. And, uh, so, uh, but I haven't shot that many globulars over the years. I, I you know for. For 40 years, I had my 12 and a half inch F4 Newtonian, and it, that F4 Newtonian focus was 1,200 millimeters or so, and I, I never considered that very long, you know, for imaging globulars. But uh, Johnny, is is this one? Did this one come from Grandfather Mountain? This one right here. Yeah, no, this, this is from the backyard. It's from the observatory here. This is December uh, 2021, wasn't it? When Comet Leonard was in the sky. And this is early. This is one morning when it before it shifted to the evening sky. Oh, uh, okay. I think around December third or so. Beautiful. Yeah. And it's a uh, it's a, a quick stack of about uh, oh, no more than four or five sixty second exposures. Comet had moved a little bit, but not much. Uh, and. Uh, that's uh, that's about all I've got. But, uh, don't have any really early stuff unless I want to go into the film archives, and that's that's too depressing to uh, <laughs> spend time there. So uh, I'd rather go through Mark's film archives than mine. No. <laughs> anyway, yeah, okay. you got you got it good nowadays, no doubt about it. So. All right, does anybody else have anything else to share? No? Okay, well, I mean, just leave here with this message that, uh, I mean, based on everything, all these pictures that people have seen, the nice thing about uh, uh, star clusters, whether it be open clusters or the target challenge that we're going to do for a globular cluster, is that uh, I, some of them are just so bright that uh, you don't have to worry about having a, a very dark sky. That's one of the, uh, one of the things that's nice about open clusters. So, uh, so anyway, I'd just like to give that as some words of encouragement for everybody out there and just say that, hey, if you want to do something for a target challenge and you're just going to simply image a uh, globular cluster and that's it, <laughs> that's fine. You can do it just about anywhere. <laughs> so I doubt you can do it like more square and downtown Raleigh, but yeah, you get the point. So uh, anyways. Okay. Uh, so yeah, first half's over. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and move on to the second half of the meeting. And this is where we will talk about uh, 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 whatever images that uh, our members have taken since uh, the last uh, time we met uh, that have nothing to do with the topic. <laughs> so uh, who would like to go? I'll go ahead again, Chris. All right, let's see what you got. All right, uh, first of all, I bought another another image of my image of the beehive cluster. Oh, that's nice. This is uh, with a 102 uh, and the uh, uh, the four the ATIC 460 EX. It's about two hours of exposure. But what's interesting about this is that in the beehive, there seems to be a lot of, of nebulosity or gas or whatever. But the really interesting thing is all these little galaxies, galaxy, 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 galaxy. There's a zillion little galaxies. Here's one here. So if you, if you image the beehive, there's one there. There's a whole bunch of galaxies in this beehive. So, so imaging this would be a very fun way to to uh, go after galaxies as well. Uh, so that, that might be a fun thing to try to do. This is just luminosity here on a monochrome camera. So it might be interesting to do this with, uh, with see how many galaxies you can bring out and including this dust or gas or whatever it is in the image here. So that's, that's a, a fun thing to do. Now, as far as new things go, 
Uh, I've been playing with uh, with this uh, that I just got uh, two weeks ago. That it's little dwarf two portable system uh, that I'm going to carry with me when I drive across country just to see what I can do with it. Uh, and here, it, here it's just it, you can. It's normally an alt ads thing, but you can make it equatorial if you just tilt it the right way. And you, and this is just a thing to look through to kind of align it on the full star, uh, roughly. And then you can do the final alignment in the in the software on the on the iPhone. And there's a button off mask you can put on it, and you can put on other kinds of filters, and you can put on uh, solar filters, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, so this is a wide field camera and this is the, the narrow camera and then you, you locate things with this and then you, you center it with this and you can control everything from the phone and you can do you can take lots of images you can take videos you can do all kinds of things with it uh, it's it's like 50 millimeters so it's pretty wide field but it's and it's very small I mean, this is hard to tell but it's very small so easily carried on an airplane or something like that, which is what I intend to do when I fly back. Uh, and so, and these these, are just, these bits here are little extra bits that you can that I bought from a from a three D printer person who did this. So that I, I just got these today, in fact. And so I'm going to try to use that when your sky is clear at some point. How much art is that thing? Uh, four hundred dollars. Oh, I guess that's doable. Yeah, so it's uh, and I've got I've got the ZWO version, that's the C Star, on order, but I won't get that till August. So I wanted to have this until 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 August, and I'll try to compare the two and see which. I suspect the ZWO will do a better job than this one does, but uh, the the lazy geek guy on YouTube has has done a lot of videos on this and showing what he can do with it, and some people have got some pretty pretty nice looking things uh, with it. Uh, sorry, um, the real day. But it's it's just a toy to play with, but it's kind of fun. It's way cheaper than than some of the two thousand dollar systems similar to it, but of course it isn't quite as good as those. But it's, it's a fun toy to play with and see what you can get with it. And then this was the first image I took of it. Uh, you put two uh, uh, ND one million filters on each on each uh, lens. And then aim it toward the sun, and you can take big sunspot pictures similar to what you get if you if you just stuck a filter on a regular camera, a white filter on a regular camera. So I did this last week when there were some sunspots in the center, and very very simple to do. You get the file, you get the file on your phone, you can send the file off to your computer for processing, whatever. And so that's what I did with this. It takes five minutes to set it up. It's, it, it has, you can, it does tracking, it does uh, go to, it does all kinds of interesting things to play with. And uh, so it's, it's a lot of fun. So that's what I've been playing with in the last couple of weeks since I got it. So, so when it takes the images, are they like raw images or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You can save them in TIFF or in FITS format. You can, you can save them to stack it. It will, it will do a, an auto stacking in the, in the camera itself, uh, in the software, and you can watch it do that. Uh, but it, you can also save those files to, to take out and stack in your own software uh, if you want. So uh, it has, a, it has a, a SD card in it that you can take out and get the files that way if you want, or you can just send them from to your phone and then from the phone to the computer, whichever way you want to do. So it's a, it's a lot of fun to play with. But the skies have been so bad, I haven't been able to do anything with solar. I mean, tried to do lunar, but I didn't, didn't get into that. So, so anyway, that's that's what I'm uh, working on right now. Very cool. Fantastic. That's all I've got. Very good. Anybody else? Yeah, I got something uh, left over for last meeting. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, the last meeting was uh, scheduled coincident with the this year's Southern Star Astronomical Convention up in the mountains, and so I was unable to attend. Um, so I wanted to share my challenge pictures from last time, which were solar Great. system. And, and Chris, I was curious. Um, I went out and looked. I didn't see last 
you know, last month's meeting out there yet? Is Anna catching up with that stuff or is it? Uh... Um, I assume so. Uh, she supposedly sent me, not supposedly, I'm sure she did. And I just can't find it. Um, sent me a link to the video and I just need to put it into a, uh, uh, into my uh, record or my uh, movie making template, if you want to call it that. Uh, and uh have it render it. So um uh, okay. yeah, I can ask her about that. And, okay. Uh, anyway, let me share my screen again. So this is the the challenge for last the last one was solar system objects and you guys specifically challenged me for some animations. I think you and Chris, I mean yeah, you and Steve. Yeah. So I searched and searched and couldn't find anything for the longest time. And finally, you know, you know right before the time was up on the time period, I, they had, we had this little near-Earth asteroid called uh, 2023 DZ2. I don't know if anybody else got to see this guy. But uh, this, is a, this is a still picture, a combined still picture of it. And uh, this is one of the famous ones I've ever uh, done. It was like... 14.2 magnitude, something like that, when I shot it from my front yard, again, with my four-inch refractor. But uh, uh, this guy is one of the fastest movers I think I've seen. He, he went from there to there in about uh, 30 minutes or so. And, wow. uh, and this is, this is a, um, uh, an ASI 1600mm um, that I like to use. And here's the animation as requested. So this is the same data as the previous picture, except this is in the animation. And how long is each one? Sorry. Uh, each frame is um, 60 seconds. And you can see how much he's moved in 60 seconds because of the streak of the asteroid. <laughs> Was this anyway, what too? I'm sorry, say again? This was with your Genesis, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Out in the front yard of my in my light polluted skies. And then here is my other uh, thing. This is series, one series. Oh, wow. And this was, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> he, um, you know, the idea was to photograph this guy as it passed over top of the of. Spiral Galaxy M100 there uh, on the right, but the weather sucked. So I took what uh, I went out a couple days early and and just photographed it that one night. I was doing something else that night, so I had the monochrome camera. Well, I had I might have been doing another thing. I had the monochrome camera on the on the telescope, so I just uh, went ahead and did this one too. But uh, this time. Uh, I shot 90 second exposures and uh, and then I stacked I stacked the group of them to produce the overall background picture and then erased out series and then took the first and the last image and pasted them back in in Photoshop and then made the animation from that. So this is, you know, incredibly rich star field, you know, in in Southern Coma Bernices, you know, close, very close to Virgo. And then my other picture is not got anything to do with the challenge. This is just one I took a while back. This was this is uh, IC 410, the Tadpole Nebula. And I shot this one in narrowband and broadband. So the the narrowband part of this picture was uh shot at two hours, and then the uh, uh, broadband for the stars was, uh, um, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. But uh, it's, it's hard to see with all the stars in it, but here are the tadpoles right here. And then I just took them, took out the stars, and showed it again in this little inset box. But that's the tadpole nebula, I see 410. Okay, that's it for me. All right, very good. Okay, anybody else? I have one picture. 
won, and I'm so disappointed. Um, I, this was taken in the I, I want to say in January, so the camera was oriented weird because I was trying to get the comet framed a certain way. Um, IC twenty eighty seven IR. It's about five hours LRGB. And from my backyard, I would want to put more time in it. It was a bear to process and get anywhere, sort of. You mean, should, should we be seeing a comet in there? No, no. Oh, this was okay. just while waiting for the comet or afterwards. I don't remember. Oh, oh okay. Um, but it was just the, to get the tail framed in the sensor I had rotated the camera. I usually run it at 90 degrees. This is like a, probably at a 170. I, I don't remember. Where is this exactly? I want to say this is off Taurus somewhere. Okay. Um, I think so. <coughs> I can pull it up on Astrobin. Hold on. Um, this is one of those projects where it's like I realized some times the my aspirations with dust are going to leave me disappointed in some ways but um not this one let me share the astro bin we can look at where it is should be share no it sharing the window okay we'll do it that way um so yeah it's right off of taurus A little close to the Pleiades? Yeah, Pleiades would be right over okay. here. So I got a, a I believe the the image I had with the comet and pirate moon cluster, the dust in the bottom right of that was this structure. So but that's all I've gotten. Okay, very good. Um uh, anybody else? No? Okay. So um let's see. Let me check the calendar here. Uh June's meeting would be tentatively let's see one on the fifteenth. So I I guess uh uh what would the um uh, was it was there a, there was an issue with uh uh scheduling the regular uh June meeting? Is that right, Naveen? No, it's scheduled. Yeah. I think the it's because of the moon phases and how we have our meetings scheduled. It ended up it's the indoor meeting is two weeks after the May meeting. It's on the ninth, according to my calendar. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, for some reason, I saw uh, an email. I thought that uh, uh, there was talk about having on a week the same at the same week as the imaging meeting or whatever i mean it's kind of sort of casually been discussed but nothing's committed to changing it yet okay well regardless anyway so the next time uh, imaging meeting will be on uh june 15th so uh yeah it was pretty cut and dry uh well I'd say dry but uh um meeting here today so uh, for tonight but uh anyways i guess we'll see everybody on june uh yeah back in, in june june 15th and uh otherwise uh i have nothing else to add uh, anybody else have anything they want to bring up no okay well good night everybody good night good night